Hello everyone. I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, anybody want to give me a thumbs up to uh, confirm that you can hear what I'm saying? That's great. Thanks for the message. Um, hi everyone. Welcome on what is a lovely sunny afternoon in Fife. Um, I'm really pleased to be hosting the first of what I think are going to be five really interesting webinars and I'm looking forward to the remaining four of them very much indeed. My name is Ian Hill. I have the magnificent job title of being the Strategic Lead for Innovation at Eden Campus at the University of St Andrews. I think it's one of those job titles that allows anything to be thrown at you. And I'm particularly involved in developing the Eden Campus as a place for uh, R&D activity and energy storage and conversion. More detail on that later. The rough structure of this afternoon's session is that I'll present for no more than 30 minutes, I'm hoping, possibly a little bit less. And then there will be plenty of opportunity for questions, answers and discussion. If you'd like to ask any questions at any point, can you log them into the group chat box? And if you're not sure where that is, on the basic Zoom toolbar, there is uh, a chat function where you can, uh, it's often under, under the little dots headed more, you can open the chat function and message everyone. So if you can post questions, you can either post them privately or you can post them so that everyone can see them. At the end, we'll gather those together and Alan Wiles is going to help me convert those into a discussion session. So just log up questions as they come along. Um, it's also worth saying, I mentioned that this is the first of five webinars. I'm assuming you've all seen the list, but there's more details on the ETP website and there are still opportunities for people to sign in for the remaining four webinars. So it'd be really nice to start a whole process of discussion and interaction for those of us who are working in some of the areas around green technologies. Okay, um, I'll kick off now. Some of you have probably seen the Eden campus development um, at the University of St Andrews. It's, uh, it's a large building site at the moment and I think it comes at a time when there's some really interesting things going on, in, particularly in this east central part of Scotland. We're living in a time where the Scottish Government has set some of the most ambitious net zero targets of any country in the world. And the response to that in this part of Scotland has been really positive. We've got the Michelin Science Innovation Park, which will be the subject of another one of these webinars in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, the Scottish Energy Strategy sets out the real ambition around decarbonising the Scottish economy. And it comes at a time when the University of St Andrews has been very positively interacting, particularly with the Tay Cities Deal Programme, which covers the Dundee, Fife and Angus area and also at a time where the university is really starting to raise its profile on some of its energy related research activity. So it's an exciting time in eastern Scotland and what we're starting to see is something that looks like a bit of a, an energy related cluster building here which I'm really keen uh, we are a key part of at the University of St Andrews and really keen that we can support over the coming years. Um, the idea behind Eden Campus is to create something where we can really boost innovation in local companies and companies across the whole of Scotland and particularly to companies working in energy storage related activity. And we're doing that by creating something, a facility on Eden Campus, or a group of facilities on Eden Campus, which will be available to a wide range of companies and will allow a focus for that interaction between university research and private enterprise. The Eden Campus development itself is very, very close to the sent to Lucas Station. You can, on the photograph on the top, you can see Lucas Railway Station to the extreme top right of the picture. It's alongside the main A road from Dundee towards St Andrews. It's a very prominent development and it gives us a lot of space for expansion and for really innovative activity. A uh, little bit of background to the site. It was a, the university acquired the site in 2011 as a former industrial site. It had been the site of initially 
Hague's first whiskey distillery. And then for much of its life, it had been the home of Curtis Fine Papers, a large paper making enterprise. And the, the paper making enterprise closed in 2008. There were substantial redundancies and quite high unemployment in the village of Guard Bridge. And the site lay derelict for some years until the university acquired it. At the point we acquired it, as you can see from this aerial photograph, which actually dates back to the 1930s, I think. But the spread of buildings on site was really quite remarkable. The site was dense with a wide variety of buildings, many of them in appalling condition, asbestos ridden and ripe for demolition. Uh, but it was a really important site locally. Uh, it's important to remember that Fife, whilst it might be thought of as a predominantly rural county, county has a very strong industrial and engineering legacy. There's a lot of industrial expertise in Fife and Curtis Fine Papers was part of that whole manufacturing activity in the Fife area, which is something that we're really keen to replicate, we're keen to promote Fife as an area where interesting manufacturing activity can continue to take place very much in a 21st century way. The, what we're trying to do on the site, and you can see from this picture how this is taken from the opposite side to the aerial photograph, but you can see how a very large central plot has been uh, voided by the removal of lots of those old buildings. We're trying to create a place where academics and industry can work together, can co-create, where industry can get access to academic expertise and where academics can help companies to commercialize some of the knowledge that exists in the university. But we're also very keen that it becomes a place where we can demonstrate on site green technologies in action. So for example, we are very keen that the site has a local renewable powered energy system for both heat and power so that much of the energy created and consumed on site will be from renewables. And ultimately we want a campus that is not just a university campus, it's a place that stimulates innovative knowledge-based economic growth in the whole of that Northeast Five Tay Cities area by using the university's expertise as a, as a springboard for commercial activity. Excuse me, it seems like my slide is stuck. Right, there we go. One of the first things we did on site was uh, redevelop one of the existing buildings into a very large six megawatt biomass boiler which is the paler coloured, the silvery coloured of the very large buildings in the front of this photograph. That biomass boiler runs a district heating network which supplies heat and hot water to 43 buildings in the town of St Andrews University buildings. Most of the university buildings on the north and west end of the town use heat and hot water from the Eden Campus biomass boiler. It's powered using locally sourced wood chip, and it is a remarkable piece of engineering. It delivers heat and hot water five to, to a town four or five miles away with a drop of only one degree in temperature between here and St Andrews. And it's also helped the university to achieve a 20% carbon reduction through the installation of that biomass boiler. What we're working on now is a major redevelopment program of some of the other buildings on the site. Uh, quite a large proportion of that has been funded by the Tate Cities Deal Programme. We've also had a grant from the European Regional Development Fund, Advanced Manufacturing Challenge Fund, which is managed by Scottish Enterprise as part of the uh, Scottish ERDF programme. And that's particularly focusing on some of the battery activity that I'll come to in a moment. The Tate Cities Deal uh, program that we are delivering as part of the whole Tate Cities Deal project really focuses on three key things on site. One of those is to upgrade the power network, which is a fairly prosaic thing that needs to be done because with the development of this size, the, the power demands will be enormous. And the current power system, the electricity power system in Northeast Fife isn't quite up to that. So we'll be putting in a new substation on site but that also allows us to start thinking about some of the innovative 
ways of producing and storing electricity. So for example, with installing a megawatt and a half of solar PV on the site, which we are then looking at being able to put through things like vehicle to grid charging and static batteries to allow us to consume more of our own electricity on site. And having one of the, a modern innovation type substation installed allows us to, to work with some of that grid balancing in a better way. So the first project is really about the infrastructure. The second project is jointly with Fife Council to develop an enterprise hub so that there is a complete support system for the growth of new business on site, which will include obviously accommodation and space, but it will also include accelerator programs, know-how, technical expertise, uh, work, close work with the business, mainstream business support services. It will include a maker's space where companies can have access to equipment, to prototype and so on. So that's part of an enterprise hub. And then the third project, which is the one that I'll go on to talk about in more detail, is the, the Genesis Centre, as it is currently known. It will probably change its name several times before commissioning. But the Genesis Centre for Energy Storage and Conversion. And we use this, the phrase energy storage and conversion as a way of describing the energy related activity with which the university is particularly engaged. The thinking behind the Genesis concept is that we will have SMEs who are either existing companies who have some particular technological problem or challenge that they need to solve or some new product development they need to address. Or we will have uh, university spin out companies or we'll have new startups. But those companies will either be looking at new product development or they'll have products that are getting closer to the market that they need some technical help. So with a combination of the university's expertise that comes from the research activity at the university and through the space that we will have available, we will help companies to develop products, to grow jobs and to scale up their manufacturing activity. And there will be location potential at Eden campus as well. So this is for companies who are not necessarily located here, but it's also for companies who could choose to locate here if they want. That's, that's all very well as a concept. Uh, what I want to go into, and I think of particular interest to the audience today is when we say energy storage and conversion, what do we mean? We're focusing particularly on three areas of activity. Uh, and these three are largely because these are the areas where St Andrews has very strong research and development expertise. The first of those is around materials and batteries. And some of you will probably know that we're a participant in a major Faraday Institute project called Next Geno, which is looking specifically at sodium ion batteries. And a lot of that work around battery materials and battery chemistries is undertaken in our chemistry department and is of direct interest to companies working in the battery space. And of course, batteries, both for static power and for low carbon mobility, have become increasingly important over the last few years. And there's a very strong connection here with a lot of the low carbon mobility activity that's taking place at the Michelin Science Innovation Park in, in Dundee, more of which you'll hear about in a, in a future seminar. So materials and batteries is an area we're particularly focusing on. We've got a lot of expertise also in fuel cells and the shift to the hydrogen economy. Uh, that's partly about hydrogen as a storage vector for uh, renewable electricity. It's partly about hydrogen fuel cells as a mobility or static power, source of power. Uh, it's also about hybrid cells as part, sorry, uh, hydrogen fuel cells as part of hybrid systems for large vehicles. So we will have facilities for the manufacture and demonstration development of fuel cells. We uh, we're in possession of an electrolyzer which will be installed on site so that we can produce what we're describing as demonstration scale quantities of hydrogen, enough to allow companies to test and develop equipment. 
And then, oh, sorry, just one more thing to add on hydrogen is also we are, along with Strathclyde University, we're partners in a major Transport Scotland funded project called the Hydrogen Accelerator. And the Hydrogen Accelerator is uh, a service, a people based service to help public and private organisations around Scotland realise hydrogen economy projects. So it's a way of uh, supporting organisations to bring forward hydrogen related projects and the, the hydrogen accelerator team will be based at, Saint, at uh, the Eden campus site. The third area of technology that we're particularly strong in is around biotechnology and synthetic fuels and we have uh, world-class expertise in various catalysis methodologies which are particularly relevant to uh, companies that are interested in turning waste products, whether that's agricultural waste or domestic waste or industrial waste into synthetic fuels. So those three broad thematic areas will be the principal focus for activity at Eaton Campus. There's a kind of underpinning fourth area as well, which I haven't put on this slide, which is around energy systems, because one of the things that's increasingly apparent to all of us working on the in-campus development is that many of these technologies are part of an integrated energy system, whether that's the energy system that exists in a bus or a truck, or whether it's the energy system that exists in a town or a university campus or a building. And so one of the things that runs in parallel with all of this is work with organizations and companies around delivering renewable based energy systems, low carbon energy systems. So a little bit about the kind of services and activities that we're likely to have on site here. Some of these are in commission at the moment. Some of these are in the planning stage, which is why I've given it the, the in time caveat. One of the first things we're going to see on site is a battery dry room, uh, which is specifically aimed at the production of battery chemistries. And I'm sorry, there's a typo there. It should say pouch cell scale up manufacturing. So allowing uh, battery based companies to start to produce um, demonstration scale, uh, effectively commercial scale cells that they can then test in detail. That battery dry room is currently being commissioned and will be installed early next year. I don't know if people have come across these facilities in other universities. We're not aware of another one in Scotland. There may be one, but the one that we've used most commonly is at the Warwick Manufacturing Group in Coventry. And effectively, it's a hermetically sealed room with exceptionally low levels of humidity, which are ideal for, for working with the complex chemistries of batteries. And if you spend more than 10 minutes inside, you come out looking like a prune. But it's going to be quite a, an advanced facility, which from our understanding is something that's going to be really valuable with a lot of battery based companies. Connected to that, of course, will be space for cell cycling, cell testing, connecting the cells up, charging and discharging them to see how they perform. And then in the uh, hydrogen fuel cell space, I mentioned that we're going to have an electrolyzer, which we can proudly say is going to produce green hydrogen because it will be part of the energy system that's connected to our one and a half megawatts of solar PV. We'll have scope for fuel cell production, so the, the physical manufacturing of fuel cells and testing them. And then the catalysis labs and being able to produce biofuels at test and demonstration scale. So this is being able to produce litres of the stuff rather than milliliters of the stuff as you might do in a, in a regular lab. And finally, what goes with all of that will be a real desire for business to business networking, uh, events, seminars and the like, and the opportunity for companies to co-work on a lot of these kind of projects. One of the things that's become clear to us in working with a lot of companies in this space is that many of these companies are highly technical, highly specific and specialized in terms of their products. And they like to work alongside other companies as part of an integrated energy system. So we regard ourselves to some extent as a kind of broker, introducing companies to each other, allowing them to work together. There are far fewer competitors in this space than there are potential collaborators. 
And so we want to design buildings and spaces that facilitate that kind of co-working activity. So in terms of where we are at the moment, I mentioned that it's a building site. This photograph was taken last week on site. Uh, there's an awful lot of bare earth and there's an awful lot of green Tyvek on roofs that don't have slates on at the moment. Through this winter and into the spring of next year, there will be a lot of activity happening on site, a lot of construction work. Uh, we've already got one major building has already been developed for university uh, admin staff who will be relocating on site in the early part of next year. I mentioned already the dry room, which should be happening during the spring of next year. And during next year also, there will be the redevelopment of um, some of these buildings in the photograph here as part of the Genesis Centre for Energy Storage and Conversion. So that's all going to be happening, hopefully, not completed over the next year, but during the next year, and also lot, an awful lot will be happening on site. We've got a work program where through the period from 2015 when we started, to 20 we had initial development work and I think the next three years are going to see some really big changes on the Eden campus site. That's all I wanted to say at the moment and I've seen a few questions popping up in the chat already and I'm happy to expand this into a wider discussion. Um, there's a very small team of us working on the Eden campus. Jeff Morris at the University, who some of you will know, is the director of the Eden campus development and I work directly to him. And between us, we are turning some very grand ideas into something really quite tangible, which I'm hoping will look very exciting in the next year or two. So I think that's all from me for now. Alan, would you like yep. to join in with some discussion? Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, this uh, has been a, a great introduction to, to this. Uh, so we'll take a, a first question. Uh, remember, if you want to ask your questions, uh, yourselves without having to type you can use the raise a hand function there's a little button uh, on the side that you can press and i'll i'll notify ian that you, you're wanting to ask a question we'll start with a question from mark fulton who's asking when will the h2 accelerator be able to support third-party players seeking to use develop the technology yeah good question thanks mark um two two answers to that um i mentioned uh, in my presentation that the hydrogen accelerator is initially a team of people and it will be supported in time by a facility for hydrogen related activity. The answer to the first part is the team of people are in the process of being recruited now. We do have the beginnings of a hydrogen accelerator team in place. We've got four people identified at or seconded to the University of St Andrews or Strathclyde. Uh, they obviously for, for COVID related reasons are not currently located on site, but they're starting to build the hydrogen accelerator profile. There is already a hydrogen accelerator web page, which if I can get the technology to work, I'll stop sharing and, uh, and I'll um, see if I can post the hydrogen accelerator web page into the, into the web chat. So the first part of the answer to that question, Mark, is the hydrogen accelerator team are available to be contacted from now onwards. And they can start to work with organizations around Scotland to support their hydrogen related developments. The facility is a longer term process. That's part of the Genesis Center for Energy Storage and Conversion. And so that will be constructed during 2020. I would like to say there'll be something happening on site during 2020, but in hydrogen related terms, it might be pushing to 2022. But I think it's, uh, it's clearly an area where we want to get some activity happening on site fairly quickly. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, I think two, two actually related questions we've got there from one from David and from Mark. I'll just string them both together because uh, they are very much on the same, uh, same side of things. Is when do you plan uh, to have any international partnerships for the Gen Genesis initiative? Uh, as in Germany, there's significant activity in green hydrogen research and development. And Mark that was asking, um, how will you actively target and engage uh, potential collaborators? Yeah, uh, 
I'll start with David because that's an area that particularly interests me actually because I've worked in European partnerships for 20 years or more. I'm very, very keen on national and international collaborations. I think in a space like this, the more you can learn from other stakeholders, the better. I'm really keen to start cooperating with the other centres that are involved in the seminar series, which I think is, is, is partly answered to Mark's question as well. The international partnerships are particularly interesting to me. I think in a, obviously in a Brexit context, this is getting a lot more difficult than it used to be. The university has engaged very actively in the past with, particularly with Horizon 2020, and will continue to engage with Horizon Europe. We're trying to put out the message very clearly that we're no longer, we're not as close to Europe as people might think, that we are still very keen to build some of those international partnerships. You're right that the German hydrogen sector is very well developed. And another area where we're very interested is the north of the Netherlands, where the three provinces in the North Netherlands are doing some really impressive work around transforming, decarbonizing their economy towards a hydrogen based economy. We do have some of those links already through individual researchers. And one of the things that I'm really keen to try and do is to capture some of that knowledge in a more systematic way. So I'd like to understand the connections that we already have. And I think many of you will know that in university, some of those connections are very personal and individual. So it's trying to work out how we can lever some of that knowledge uh, that exists in individuals and make it useful for even campus try and build some of that knowledge into what we're doing here. I'm uh, working closely with some of the people in our research funding team to try and identify future funding opportunities, which particularly does include international collaborative projects, EU funded projects in particular, so that we can continue to try and build those international relationships. In terms of just expanding that out slightly to Mark's question, which is about targeting and engaging with potential collaborators. I think there's a number of different elements to that. Certainly in the private sector, we have quite a list of contacts already with private companies and we're really keen to expand that. And part of the Advanced Manufacturing Challenge Fund, ERDF funded project that I mentioned earlier, is very much about expanding our private user base to try and reach out to companies working, particularly in battery technologies in that case and encourage them to engage with us, use the facilities, have access to our researchers. So obviously private companies are going to be our users, they're going to be our uh, source of income as well as, as our potential collaborators. But I think there are other collaborating organizations, for example, other universities that again, we work with on an informal basis, or we work through large networks like Scott Chem and like ETP. And part of the purpose of this seminar today is to try and build some of those connections through those networks. The other thing I want to say is um, that we are in the process of building a private sector dominated advisory forum. So what we want to do is try and engage companies in a kind of informal reference group so that we can check out our proposals with them so that we can bounce ideas off them and we can build them into the process of developing the facility because in terms of where we are in scoping a facility for energy storage i've shown you some very fancy diagrams and there's some clear ideas there but translating that into a certain number of square meters for this kind of activity in this kind of building is actually quite a complex process and that's the process that we're just starting to embark on now. So over the next three to four months, we'll be reaching out to a number of different potential users to start to talk to them about what kind of activities would they want to undertake on site? What kind of facilities would they like to see? So that we can then translate that into lines on plans that people can build. Okay. Um... I can't see any other questions just yet, but I, I wanted to ask you something, uh, if, if I may. Um, where do you see the place of the Eden campus and, and the Genesis Center in terms of skills provision? Um, you know, in terms of providing skills training for, for undergraduates for, effectively, if this is going to be the, the economy of tomorrow, we also need to train the workforce of tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's a really, really good question, actually, Alan. And, and, 
it's something that we've we've acknowledged in our proposals to take cities deal obviously as a university we have a very strong skills focus we are already doing pieces of work with undergraduates where we've got undergraduates undertaking dissertations and projects uh, on the Eden campus site uh, we are hosting groups of undergraduates from things like the geography and sustainable development department at the university who have always been really supportive of the Eden campus development so we're trying to contribute to the university's teaching I think the thing that's going to make a really big difference is uh, I mentioned that we've got one large building that's ready to open for a university administrative staff. And once that happens, we'll suddenly see a lot more people coming on and off site. And the, the awareness of what's happening at Eden Campus will raise amongst the university. And I'm really keen then that we are available as a resource to students. One of the things we haven't thought about is whether we're potentially an interesting resource to other people's students. And I think that's something that we ought to be looking at over the next couple of years. When, when we've got one of the biggest biomass boilers in this part of Scotland and a really exciting district heating network, which is reasonably rare in the country, and we're starting to install a really interesting renewable powered energy, uh, sorry, electricity system on site. I, I think the potential there for student projects, for student visits and student activity is enormous. And I'd like to see us being part of that. I'd like to see us being available to academics, students from across Scotland as a mm -hmm. case study of, of what you can do on 13 hectares of brownfield land if you've got a reasonable vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah. I think we're, for, we're fortunate in, in doing that at a time when uh, energy technology is accelerating at such a pace that we can start to install things on site that we didn't even think we'd be installing two or three years ago. Sorry, okay. you, were going to, you were going to add to that, Alan. Yeah, I was going to add, I mean, for one of the things that Scott Kemp is trying to, to, to do at the moment is to try and bring together uh, higher ed education and further education, because there are some very substantial further education skills training for, for chemistry, for, for engineers. Uh, it's not necessarily the higher education, but they, they are... Uh, it's a, there's very a, a strong base in Scotland, and and whether or not there were plans to interact with that stage, obviously the the university link is almost obviously there. It's just whether or not you saw an interaction with further education. Um, before, um, uh, if you want to uh, answer that one specifically, uh, I'll let you. But I'll also mention that Mark has asked another question: um, Are you actively looking for funding for your plans? Um, would you consider funding and uh, a pack to secure uh, additional funding? Um, I'd, I'd, it would be helpful if Mark could explain to you what he means by funding and a pack. Mark, could you raise your hand uh, and that way we'll, we'll enable you to talk? Or if Sarah could uh, enable Mark, uh, Mark's microphone, that may help. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, we've got you, Mark. Hello there. Um, what I meant was hunting as a pack. So it's working <laughs> with others to actively um, target a potential funding bodies and actually target funding and maybe even come up with propositions. Um, I, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It's not something that I've thought of hitherto, but I don't think there is a there's not a, uh, an in-principle problem with that. We, we have already indulged in some collaborative funding bids to various funding sources. So we have already worked with other partners and, and actually the, um, the hydrogen accelerator that I mentioned earlier was a joint Strathclyde St. Andrews initiative to, um, to secure the funding for the hydrogen accelerator. So I think the idea of uh, funding as a pack makes it sound really sort of quite scary and aggressive. But I think if, if the principle is collaborative funding bids, then yes, absolutely. We are definitely looking actively for funding for our plans because I've mentioned Tay Cities Deal money and we've got a grant of 26 million off the Tay Cities Deal programme, which sounds fabulous. Um, but of course, with a site this size, it's going to go, it's not going to cover the whole site by any means. So we are still working on funding and we're still open to the idea of collaborative funding applications. Can I ask a supplementary? Of course you can. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'm just sort of thinking that we've, we've 
we've probably got some very similar objectives and with the you know the challenges with um with climate change and what have you and, and Greta's take on science are, are very much at the front so I, I think there's a need for us to find ways to, to make it such that we we're contributing to plans to to close um the gaps that exist so i mean i've got no no problem with with um with being very proactive in doing that because i think we should be doing that we should be seeking to um continually raise the bar um i, I don't think it's enough just to 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 say we'll do our best we've got to make sure that we're doing what we need to do yeah yeah absolutely um i'll, I'll just mention alan while, while while folk are looking at questions uh mm -hmm. david to come back on the um the question about german green hygiene initiatives i've noticed that david's just uh, posted up a link to a presentation and said uh I've put, given some information on the Bavaria Scotland partnership on hydrogen attached for background as a presentation I gave recently for a Scottish development international webinar. So thanks very much indeed for that, David. That's really interesting. I look forward to looking at that. Yes, um, I, was, I was going to point, point it out. Uh, if, if you want, if you can't see it, make sure that you press on the chat button at the bottom of your screen and you should see all the conversation that's happened so far and you'll see uh, the file that's been uploaded by David and you'll be able to have a look at that uh, as, as Ian says it. I've, I've scrolled really quickly through it whilst we were talking and it looks very interesting. Yeah, there's some really good stuff happening there. Um, can I just jump on Alan to um, another, I noticed a question from Ali, Ali Robertson about relationship with MSIP and I think it kind of connects to the um, answer I've just given to Mark. Mm -hmm. Um, because Ali's question is, how do you ensure you have a relationship with MSIP, the Michelin Park, which adds value to both developments rather than competing in the innovation space. And I think that, that is a, a brilliant and really perceptive question because on paper, there's a lot of similarities between what's happening at Michelin and what's happening here at Eden Campus. And it's something that we already recognized between the two institutions some time ago. So we started some initial conversations with MSIP during last year. And uh, that's resulted in signing a memorandum of understanding between St. Andrews and MSIP which sets out some of the areas of expertise that each organization has and the areas where we'll collaborate and also the areas where we might delineate between our activity. And as an example of that, being a university, we obviously do a lot of research work in the low TRL levels, you know, TRLs sort of three, four, five. With MSIP, they're very uh, capable of handling large scale manufacturing. So there's a clear distinction there between the things we do and the, the the levels in the innovation value chain that we tend to operate at. But I think the general point there that I want to draw from that is about the collaborative nature of relationships rather than the competitive nature of relationships. Because when you've got two uh, facilities that like ourselves and MSIP are a dozen miles apart, there is the potential to trip over each other in the innovation space, or there's the potential to make something really valuable out of that collaboration. And the second slide I showed you identified MSIP and ourselves as part of being some really interesting cluster. So I'm talking up constantly the energy storage opportunities of the, the Tay Cities, Fife area and saying, look, this is something really valuable that's happening across this area through multiple organisations. And this is why it's worth engaging with it. So we've got a raise hand, but before we move on to that, there's another question that we, we skipped over. Uh, yep. That's from Helen Robertson asking whether or not a digital learning strategy will be built into the overall strategy of the, the campus. Um, my, my honest answer is I don't know. Um, it's not this stage in development of the campus. Um, I'm not sure we've really thought about the digital learning strategy and as an aside, what I'll add to that are the, the implications of a post-COVID world, which is something that we're trying to come to terms with, but that's clearly going to have implications for digital learning. So I'm sorry, Helen, that it's a bit of a lame answer, but it's not something that's immediately on our radar, and perhaps it ought to be. Okay. Um, Sarah, Peter, you had your hand raised, but you've removed it now. Did you have a question or was it uh, a mishap on the uh, on the keys? If if you still have a question, make sure that you, you raise the hand again and, and I'll pass on to you. 
Um, we've got one question from Brian Vant. Uh, sorry, you missed the beginning of the presentation. Uh, do you target technologies mapping or combination of technologies and demand side management to reduce carbon dioxide? Does that, does that, I'm not sure I, I see the question there, uh, obviously, but is that basically what the, the, the campus is trying to do? So let me just read that again. Uh, and, and, and Berang, if you want to clarify that, stick your hand up and um, Sarah can give you the, uh, the floor. I think we'll wait until that's clarified a bit better, or if it was just a general comment uh, rather than the question. Yeah, Sarah, because she's got her hand up again, so we'll, we'll just take a question. Uh, Sarah, if you could uh, enable her microphone. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, actually, uh, my question is that uh, I missed the beginning of the presentation, sorry for that one. And the target of this plan, the target of this uh, work is to minimize the carbon dioxide by technologies, for example, renewable energy systems or the combination of technologies plus uh, demand side plus control algorithms to control, for example, uh, when possible to uh, store energy, when possible to uh, get energy, renewable energy systems, or et cetera. So uh, which one? Yeah, in, in, in a way, it's, I mean, you're, you're right that there's a very strong driver in the campus around the technological fix, as it, as it were, the, the new technologies that are going to help us to reduce carbon. But that clearly doesn't happen without demand side management, as you rightly say. Uh, we're not particularly working in things like energy efficiency, but I think when you're operating in wider energy systems, as we are, I think there is by necessity a requirement to look at energy balancing and usage and the demand requirements so that you can design a system that is ultimately lowering energy, not just lowering carbon. As an example of that, we are currently, as a university, we're currently participating in a major project that Scottish Power Energy Networks are running in Northeast Fife called Project Fusion. And the idea of Project Fusion is to try and reduce the overall demand of the Northeast Fife grid through demand side uh, management of energy. So, for example, it might involve us turning off certain university systems at night or at key times of the day when they're not required and when it can relieve pressure on the whole grid and the energy system that we're developing in Eden campus hopefully will be a kind of microcosm of that in that what we would like to do as we start to produce more of our own renewables is we'd like to be able to manage and use those on site as much as possible so I think the facilities on Eden campus will be very much about the technological solutions whereas the the actual existence of Eden campus what it, what exists on site in terms of the networks and the technologies that, are, that that help the site to function will hopefully demonstrate some of that demand side management as well okay uh, so Sarah you've um, uh, will will enable your microphone now if you can ask your question Hi, can you hear me now, folks? Yeah, hi, Sarah. Hi, um, I just wanted to um, chip in after Ian had commented on the question from um, Ali about the relationship between MSIP and Eden Campus. Um, I've recently taken up a role with MSIP as Innovation Director, and as part of that, we um, are planning to have a, a regular kind of touch point between MSIP and Eden Campus to make sure that the relationship is very much on the collaborative front rather than competitive. Um, and I think the a kind of demonstration of that so far has been that a number of the, the companies that are interested in MSIP at the moment have actually come from links with St Andrews University. So um, we're very much on the page of, of trying to work collaboratively and, and to carve out our own spaces. As, as Ian had indicated, um, the university is, is very much looking at the kind of research level activities. Um, we don't have that capacity here at MSIP, even with the companies that are, are looking to locate here at the moment, they're looking at much later stage TRL levels. So I think there's a, there's a fairly clear um, gap kind of being defined between MSIP and Eden Campus at the moment that um, is helpful 
and I think it's just going to take an ongoing con conversation between us and understanding of who's doing what where to, to make sure that we're, we're maximising the opportunity from both investments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't have put it better. Well done, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so just uh, so you're aware that Mark is interested in taking that up. Uh, more of the conversation with you at at a further stage. Uh, sure. So if if you can touch base uh, after this, yeah. um, any any further questions? Um, I had a couple more that just from my my own interest to see how how things are developing in the the campus. But I'll just wait a little bit. Um, Max included his uh, phone number uh, to to touch base with it. Um, I was going to ask one of the things you you said about the the, the power input into Eden Campus. You, you mentioned a few things, but I, I was wondering whether or not you just all considered to have wind energy inputs to see the integration of wind energy with um, with the stationary um, side of storage and also within wind energy and uh, hydrogen production. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's a really good one. Um, let me. I'm just. I don't know if this will work, but somewhere out of the window there. Is, is Lucas Air Base. Uh, we're only about a mile from, from the old Lucas Air Base. The, the university currently has uh, plans to develop a wind farm on university owned land, actually not at Eden Campus, but just to the south of the town where uh, it's a more logical development for, for wind. That development has stalled because of concerns from the MOD about radar interference. So uh, the answer is yes, we'd love to, but we're not allowed to at the moment. But in, okay. in, an, in an ideal world, yes. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think in, in, in Fife, a combination of wind plus solar PV is an absolute winner in both respects. And it would be a fabulous adjunct to our energy supply. And the plans we mm -hmm. have are a fairly substantial wind farm development. Uh, which would be wonderful and really help us with some of the potential storage options where I've mentioned already hydrogen and we are really interested in starting to develop some static power mm -hmm. battery, static battery uh, storage options as well, partly as a, as a demonstration purpose. So yeah, it's on the agenda, but when, who knows? Okay. Um, the, the final question I had, again, for, that's from my background in energy storage. Uh, do, do you plan to incorporate into the Eden campus facilities for, um, for fast, uh, fast track testing, um, stress testing of, of, of storage and also safety testing of storage? Um, what kind of storage are you thinking of? So when you when you're talking about you know long term storage and particularly large scale storage, uh, there's always a, a need to um, to demonstrate the the lifetime possibilities of any kind of technology, and therefore there needs to be an implementation of uh, of stress testing or, or accelerated testing, as, as some people say it, mm -hmm. to demonstrate that that technology is viable for uh, you know the the the. 15 to 20 years that you might see on the sticker if you if you like to see i yeah, just don't yeah. know whether or not that would be implemented as part of it no I, th I think it is in certain technology areas i've mentioned things like for example long-term battery performance where what we'd like to have is the ability to um to have facilities where people who are developing new battery chemistries can can test them over an extended period of time to see how they perform uh i think it's probably happening more on a technology by technology basis at the moment. Um, and that, you know, perhaps it's, it's something that, that starts to emerge as you have particular testing needs uh, with, with certain companies for certain technologies. Maybe that's something we need to build into our plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but good point. Thanks, Alan. Uh, there's just a link from Helen, I think regarding uh, the question on uh, integrated uh, digital learning. If you take a note of that uh, that link that's in the chat, yeah, um, that you. might lead to some of some information. Um, I think that there are few fewer questions coming through. Just if it, again, if anybody wants to engage with the conversation, we'll welcome your your contribution. Um, and presumably, as well as recording the webinar, will you circulate the the slides? Um, Sarah might know the answer to that one. Mm. I think they'll Not be sure. part of the recording anyway. Yeah. Yes, they will. Certainly. Um, 
because I will encourage people to contact me on the, the email that's on the end of the slides and I will just put it into the chat as well, uh, just so that people can contact me if they want to. That's very oh. helpful, thank you. Uh, oh yes, uh, we, we we skipped over one of the questions from Mark. Uh, so thanks for putting it back up here. Uh, is how does this integrate with the just transition objectives? Oh yes, um, that's really interesting. The, the, the university has a transitions team who um, who do a lot of work around around just transition activity. Um, that's a that's a short question which demands quite a long answer, doesn't it? Um, we are very conscious of ourselves as part of the Guardbridge community. Guardbridge is, you know, a fairly typical Fife village with a population of about 350 at the moment. And we are really conscious of being part of a transition in Guardbridge. So this is not a small island of something that exists in a village that gets no benefit from it. We're already starting to look at how we can collaborate with the village on things like, for example, energy production. Um, we are very conscious of our responsibilities as a, as a good neighbour. Uh, we try and walk the talk as much as possible. So the site as a whole, the Eden Campus site, will include electric vehicle parking. The university is increasingly buying electric vehicles for its fleet. We'll have vehicle to grid charging. We have electric bikes here that we use to get back and forth to St Andrews. And we're going to have electric bike charging on site. So we're trying to think about as many elements of uh, a low carbon economy as possible. And we won't always get it right, but it is something that we're conscious of. Mm -hmm. This is not just a research lab in the middle of a nice piece of green sward. This is a piece of brownfield land, which we're trying to turn into something really genuinely sustainable in the long term. We've just been having a conversation this morning about solar lighting for some of the pathways, for example. Um, which may or may not happen, may or may not happen, but the point is that we're actually trying to think about how many ways mm -hmm. we can demonstrate the transition in a way that means something for people who can come onto the campus. Yeah, I think one of the, um, I saw, I don't know whether or not you were aware of it, I saw a, a really interesting demonstrator building at the University of Swansea, uh, where mm. they built a, almost a, 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 a carbon negative building as such, uh, where they had a, everything was integrated and it was a demonstrator of everything that can be integrated into a circular building effectively uh, by having, you know, they were looking at all the stages, you know, the insulation, the energy um, um, production and the energy storage and, and how the building is managed itself. So they were looking at the entirety of the, of the, of the energy uh, demonstrator in that way. Yeah. Uh, wondering whether or not you, you'd come across that uh, and how you would see this uh, similar type of thing fitting in your plans. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've seen some reference to that and I've also seen something similar, I think, at the Energy Systems Catapult in the West Midlands that yes. has a demonstrator building. And I think it's a, it's a kind of you know, regular domestic building that you can show how new green technologies can work in, a, in an ordinary context. And I think that kind of demonstration stuff is really, really valuable. Um, what we've got, we're, we're, it's, quite, it's quite an odd development here at Eden Campus because we're dealing with some truly quite massive ex-industrial buildings. They're really big when you get inside them. And so you're not quite going to talk to what people can do in their own homes, but what you can do is make a wider point about here's where our electricity is coming from on site and here's what we're doing with it. And do you know that the, the hot water in these, in these pipes is coming out of our district heating plant, which is just over the other side of the park and so on. So I think we are conscious that we've got a very strong educative function in what we do on site here. Okay. Um, there's another link by, sent by Helen. Um, I assume, Sarah may, may be able to put a, um, a combination of all the links and, and, and slides and things that have been uh, put in as part of a dissemination after the, after the fact um, yeah. so that people can find, uh, find reference to those. Um, 
Sarah, Peter, you still have your hand up. Is that because you have another contribution to make? Nope. There you go. It, it came down very quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, with, with that in mind, uh, uh, <laughs> that's all right, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I think we, we've just filled the hour. I'm conscious of not taking more time from, from people as, uh, as has been uh, taken already. Thank you again, uh, Ian, for, for taking part and for introducing what the Eden campus is, is trying to do and, and your, your, your thoughts for the future. Um, and thank you to everyone for uh, contributing with your questions and with the, with the conversation. I think this is exactly what we want out of those, uh, those little seminars, um, trying to get the conversation going so we really understand where all those, um, those centres fit in, 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 in the development of Scotland as such uh, and, and the, the, the part that they have to play in the interaction with business, with academia and, and, and also with our, our society. Yeah, uh, so, thanks so much, Alan, and thanks to you and Sarah for um, for organising. It's been really good. Not a problem. So we'll wave uh, goodbye to everyone. Thank you again, Ian, and thanks everyone for your contributions. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.